Okay, everyone. Uh, it's six o'clock, so we want to all have dinner or go home on time. So we'll get started. So uh, welcome to the sixth week of me not teaching this course. Um, so we have a nice guest lecture, as we always do, from our students, all of you. Uh, today we're covering uh, RNN variants, vanishing gradients, uh, LSTMs. I don't think they're considered fancy anymore. These are pretty normal things, right? Uh, LSTNs and GRUs are pretty uh, standard, uh, not so fancy, but not as vanilla as, a, as an RNN. Okay, anyways, um, a couple of announcements. You guys already know project uh, proposals are due, so I will be looking through those uh, shortly on the Slack channel for that. So if you have any questions about that, please put them up. I know there is questions about whether first-year PhD students in the department actually have to do a project, because the slides say you don't, and then I said you do. So uh, I think the answer is because there's a conflict, I will err on the side of not requiring you to. Yay! So um, <laughs> you are welcome to do the project. I highly encourage you to do it, because uh, if you are trying to make an investment into deep learning, you should be doing it, whether I require it or not. There are plenty of people surrounding you because you're outnumbered, I think, three to one uh, by other people who want to do a project, who want to participate. And uh, I encourage you to interlink, uh, connect up with them, and uh, do a project with them uh, in consultation to them. Okay? So please do do that. Um, without further ado, uh, can I see who are our week six questioners? One, two, three. Okay, so uh, four, Adam as well. So uh, you guys keep the Slack channel busy, ask questions out loud, whatever you like, uh, as you guys have already formulated. And our presenters, I guess, are in the front row. They look very tired and fatigued from making their slides. So we'll let them get on with their business so they can have all their butterflies out of their stomach. So let's welcome our uh, week six presenters. So you guys can go ahead. Okay, so um, so this so this this lecture six is about this fancy RNN, and so the first part is going to be about uh, basically the vanishing gradient problem, and then uh, uh, basically how this is sort solved in uh, LSTM goose by direction network. And so, so okay, so I'm at the honor of starting this. Oh, there was a. So I'm going to start with a uh, uh, like two slides of refresher, even though like last time it was uh, you know, stuff was already covered very well. Uh, so this is the uh, RNN uh, basic structure. So you can see that there is uh, basically uh, we input words, that then uh, there is word embedding, and then there is this basically the, um, there is each uh, cell is uh, doing a basic operation by hanging around uh, this uh, this uh, shared weight matrices. And in this way, basically, there are two inputs in each, in each cell, uh, one coming from the word itself and one coming from this lateral connection that is basically uh, the, uh, conditional, uh, um, the conditioning on the, on the actual word. So in this way, we can take track of what is happening before. And at the end, uh, we have on top, uh, we have the um, proposed answer from our network, and this E1 is the error at uh, time t equal one. I, I guess in the past um, slides, last time it was called the J, but it's exactly the same thing. So I kept the notation now with this uh, with the slide. And uh, so this is like uh, just a one single cell. You may have seen the different diagrams. Uh, somebody thinks that they are uh, you know more clear. Somebody thinks that they are kind of not very um, you know, useful. Uh, but I think it's quite nice. Uh, so you can see that from the left we have the input uh, from the uh, previous cell, and this input is uh, multiplied by the uh, this the shared weight matrix, matrix, and this is added by the other uh, the actual input at time t, okay, together with the bias. Then this is uh, passed through a nonlinear function, and this is uh, this H t that is um, over here. Right. So this is like the first part, and then uh, and then in the second part, the output of this. Was other uh, multiplication is uh, U, and there is another non-linear, which is the top one. 
and then uh, we have these, uh, there are two outputs. One is the proposed answer, and one is this HD that is going to be the input of the next cell. So um, let's see basically what is now the vanishing gradient problem. So the vanishing gradient problem, of course, is not um, only a problem in uh, RNN. It's a problem that you can find uh, you know, in the deep learning. Uh, but the way that you take care of it in uh, RNN is different than uh, the way you take care of it uh, in, uh, for example, uh, in just a uh, feed forward network. Um, in, the, in the slides, and then um, in this paper that is over there, uh, I found quite useful. Uh, um, we've been using uh, this simplified form of the uh, RNN. So you can see that it's a little bit different than the one that I showed you before. So now only H, that is the output of the uh, time t minus one, goes through this uh, nonlinearity. Okay. So this this is because it simplifies the calculation. Uh, at the end, it doesn't give. Uh, there is not much different uh, in the in the result. So that's why uh, the authors of this paper, they consider this network instead of uh, the, um, the previous one. Okay, so the error, as we have seen, uh, is the sum of the error at each uh, time step. And then um, it's, it's enough here to consider basically uh, the error at, time, at some ET that is fixed. And then uh, I think it's useful to just, you know, like doing the first for a very simple case, so you just fix T. Okay, for example, and then you just go to the uh, you know, like just uh, the um, But um, you can see that there is uh, this term here that is, um, I think, the, the interesting term that you have to keep track of. So the first one that is, I really like E2, it's just basically the empirical error, okay? So that uh, it's proportional to the difference between uh, the network um, answer and the label data that we give, so the answer that we give to the network. And, um, Basically, uh, this thing here, uh, I think that we have to show notes in the other because the notation was a little bit uh, changed, but this is just a total derivative. Okay? You can uh, just express this as a total derivative, and then if you want to express it in a partial, partial derivative, you can validate it by just putting the, the terms together. Um, that's not that, um, of course, like important. What's important is that. Uh, we have defined this term there, okay? So this term there is basically, what is it? it it's, it's the derivative of H at, uh, at the, the actual one that we're looking at and the one, with respect to the one that comes before. And uh, now of course we can now, since we understood how it works, we can just generalize it to any T, and then uh, uh, in the lectures it starts coming from uh, K, right? So that's how you get that, uh, uh, this, uh, the first, Question. The second one uh, is basically, um, if you remember the slide before, it's just basically a product of which of you know, like this weight matrix time, uh, this F prime. Uh, okay, so if you put everything together, you can write it in this in this way. Now, W there, it's, uh, I would like a smaller hat on it because it's, a, it's basically uh, it's a vector. Okay, so it's a vector of these weight matrices. Okay, so you multiply that by uh, this diagonal matrix and you get exactly, you know, um, what is on the left side, so it's just a compact way. The reason why it's written like that is that in this way you can recognize that it is basically, uh, it's like a Jacobian. But that's easy because it looks like basically a uh, change of data uh, or change of variables, basically. That's what Jacobian is. Um, but it's not important. The point is that this describes the, um, how the information is propagating through the network, okay? So if these terms become smaller, of course, like, uh, you know, it's a problem because the information is not propagating. So let's see the, there is a simple proof here. I'm not completely sure that it's, uh, but, but anyway, so it's a simple, simple proof, that's why. So first of all, you have to, you have to assume that uh, the derivative of this, um, this linear function is bounded, okay? And um, so it means that, you know, like it doesn't explode. And then, then uh, we have the norm uh, also of this, um, of this term that we've seen before, okay, that is, as we said before, that the consequence of, of point one, point two means that basically it has to be smaller or equal to some uh, number, okay, that it's, that, that's why it's, um, it comes from the, uh, the fact that it's bound. Uh, okay, so the, given this uh, first assumption, okay, uh, now we just look at the, um, at one, uh, uh, one of these terms, okay, 
and then after we can take the problem. Okay. So first we would just look at one. So for each j, if j, uh, it's quite easy to basically, okay, so this is just the Cauchy's force inequality. So we'd use this because we want to use uh, the first assumption. And then you see that basically, so the, the point here is as follows, is that W is a matrix, right? So we look at the uh, largest eigenvalue of lambda 1, and then uh, um, for the moment, we assume that lambda 1 is smaller than 1 over gamma. Okay, with gamma was the value that was bounding uh, uh, the, other, the other term, the other node. Okay. So this means that, uh, you see, like, you get basically uh, 1 over gamma gamma, so this is or more than one, okay, this term alone. Or in general, you have um, you know, some terms eta that is more than one. So this is the notation it was in the other, uh, in the previous slides. And now you can consider the full expression. So how does it work? Uh, you can actually look at just the scaling to see uh, how does it work, but it's easier like that just to do it, uh, you know, for a simple case first. So you have, uh, for example, two, two of these terms. And so you, you, you get a eta squared, and then, you know, like, if you repeat, you can see that basically you get the eta to the t minus k, okay? So, remember that eta here is more than one, okay? So, in the case that you are um, um, in the long term, okay? So long term means that I fix k, so, and then I look at, you know, like at my, the actual point t that is like some steps away. So if this t is much bigger than k, uh, then you see that you can see that basically the exponent is t, so it basically goes like t, but eta is more than one, and so these things keep decreasing, right? So that's how it goes to zero. And then um, this is, you know, this is pretty much it. And then you can do the same, uh, uh, the same consideration, now you can do it for exploding, right? So you just have to change the, um, this inequality with the largest eigenvalue. Instead of being, uh, assuming lambda one is smaller than one over gamma, you assume it's bigger than one over gamma. And then, you know, you're just going through the same steps, but now the point is that eta is bigger than one. So you see that now, basically, as you move far in time, uh, that thing, eta, keeps growing. And so that's why, basically, you have, um, uh, you have these things that is growing. Now, this is, uh, of course, it's a problem. Huh? Why? But, as I said, it's like a, me a measure of uh, the past and the future. So how basically this information uh, is transmitted. And so, uh, and so basically, if this goes to zero, uh, it means that you lose that information, or if it goes to infinity, basically you, know, you will not be able to solve uh, the problem anyway. And then, uh, of course, there is a solution for this, and so I need my colleagues to explain oh, what the solution is. So I'd like you guys to think about the problem first before I present the proposal or the solution. If you guys have questions or yeah. concerns, bring it up. Yeah. So wait, um, so so you're saying? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. Well, we're looking at the norm, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we're looking at the, you see, like, um, you're actually looking at the, uh, you're right that it's, um, you know, the insider is a vector, right? But we, we're taking the norm of the vector, right? Okay, so, it's, it's, so the directions, you know, like, it, it's just the magnitude. Then you are asking, okay, can I basically, the point is, like, if it gets too small, right, can I basically rescale it in such a way that I... You know, multiply by by some constant in such a way that basically it doesn't get uh, it doesn't get small each time you multiply by a constant. Right. Um, okay, that's what the problem. Um, about the rest of you, do you guys have uh, a thought about how to keep coming? So just be scaling fixed. Then it fixed.
Yeah, but yes, uh, that's what I was thinking. But and uh, I was thinking that if it's um, it's a, it's a global and scale factor, it doesn't matter. But in this way, it will not work because each time you have to scale it by different things, and then you change the signal as it's saying, and then it's not good anymore. You, you know what I mean? Like if it's uh, the rescaling here would be like if it was the same, exactly the same for all the at each step. Uh, then uh, it shouldn't matter when you take the gradients because uh, you know the minimum uh, is defined. Uh, uh, it's up to a constant, right? But yeah, but here you are. You know, like to achieve what you're saying, I think to, you have to rescale uh, each, each time. At each step, you have to rescale, mm -hmm. and then you have different factors, and then you're changing the signal. So basically, yeah. you're not solving anymore. Uh, so if it's a global factor, it's like you know, that then uh, then it would probably would maybe it would work. I don't know, but I think you know, I mean, you know, actually it increases, but uh, that's not our target to mm -hmm. right? You increase or you multiply some number there. Yeah, but yeah. 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 So if if you change the if you if you change each step, you change it differently, right? Then uh, it will for sure it will change the um, you know. Uh, the signal, and so it means that it will change the weight update and so on. So it, it will not lead you to the same um, um, to the same result. Uh, maybe it's like adding, yeah, like noise. It's even worse. Well, clipping is a little bit different, right? Yeah. So it's um, you cannot, yeah. Yes. Well, clipping is not the same as uh, multiplying by uh, constant, right? So it's like putting a. In principle, you could put like, uh, um, like you know, like a lower cutoff. So that's what you're thinking. Like clipping is like putting a higher cutoff. Yeah, but the problem is that you refactor it. Yeah, yeah, but then that. Yeah, the problem is that you, you have to refactor it in different ways at each step. And then basically this leads you to, um, it, you know, it, it can uh, probably lead you away to the, to the correct uh, optima. Uh, guys in the back all here what the conversation is about. Basically we're having this conversation about, you know, magnitude versus direction. The hard piece is saying that the direction of the reading is conserved, but let's worry about the set size, right? With the with either exploding gradient being too large a set size or a vanishing gradient being too minute. And we're we're debating whether or not uh, you know scaling that would reduce some part of the signal. Mathematically already in the signal, but for now it's not. So we'll come to uh, clipping and other things very soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I hope these types of discussions are helpful. I, I really don't want it just to be lecture. It really should feel like a study group. I know this is not the optimal setup for a study group. It it's a lecture like that you can get. But uh, I, I hope uh, by using Slack and, and by uh, having the questions speak out, it will be more interactive.
Yeah, so I'll be talking more on why vanishing gradient is a problem, and then I'll move on to the solution. So just to reiterate, um, uh, like vanishing gradient, having gradient too small, too many steps backwards, meaning we cannot propagate the information from the many steps backwards to, to the current time step. So, so here, uh, this is a formula. So when dhd, dhk going to zero, so we cannot tell if there's no dependency between t and k in the time step, or uh, we have wrong initialization or wrong configuration of our parameters. So I'll illustrate more on this. So uh, this is the diagram we saw just now. Uh, imagine we are trying to sample our fifth. We are at our fifth time step. And we want to predict what the what's the word we, we want to turn out. So and we'll calculate the E5, the error for the fifth time step, and then we'll propagate backwards to update our W. So this is the formula for the gradient, the E over D theta. This theta is um parameter, so it stands for W and bias. So W H, W E, and also the bias. So uh to calculate the gradient for time step number five, we'll do DE5 over D theta. And then um, it's a sum of all the previous time steps, including, like, actually there's an there's a error, like typo here. So there should be a DE5 over D theta here as well. But it should be the same on the formula. So this equals to V4, and then you, you break it into chain rule, and you, you just propagate backwards. So DE5, you, you calculate the sum of DE4, DE4 and then DE3, DE2, and DE1, um, the gradient. And then if your, your gradient, when uh, this is DE4, DE5, so like DE5 goes back to DE4, and then E5 to E3, and so on. And at your E1, it is 0, meaning it's 0 here. So meaning the whole thing here is zero, so it's zero here. So that's why there's no information propagating from one back to five. So that's the whole point. So um, we, cannot, uh, we, cannot, we cannot get the reference for the word the and students when we try to predict the word exam or book. So that's why vanishing gradient is um, uh, for, it's a long range, uh, long temporal range problem in, in Ireland. So that's why it will affect our language model. And then um, when predicting the, ne the next word, information from many time steps in the past cannot be taken into consideration. So this is one example. So one solution is um, we can improve the vanishing gradient with good initialization and using a different activation. Normal, um, Normal activation for RNN at first is just sigmoid. But um, recently, researchers have found that if we use values, um, we can, uh, because ReLU is a re rectified linear unit, so it's linear. So the gradient is always one or zero. So you can never get like vanishing gradient. And um, also, when you initialize W to the identity matrix, then um, it will sort of retain the information. You can read more on the paper, um, you can more, read more in this paper, a simple, it's a paper by Google uh, in 2015. So um, in, the, in this paper, they were doing this experiment um, to compare between different configurations of the network. One is LSTM, so this is the fancy LSTM. Uh, so the whole point of the paper is to um, prove that a simple initialization with red loop, with uh, ReLU can outperform LSTM, which is something very complicated. So LSTM is the green one, and then IRNM is our simple configuration of identity matrix and ReLU. Um, the two in between is RNN plus uh, 10H, and also RNN and ReLU. So RNN with different activation function, and for this one is RNN plus ReLU plus the identity matrix for W. So um, they, do, they were doing in some endless recognition tasks, and they, say, they show that the um, 
simple configuration outperform LSEM. So, so they say um, actually simple configuration is better than LSEM. And um, this is to say um, to show that when they use ReLU for gradient, uh, I actually don't get this graph. Uh, maybe you can help me because. Uh, yeah, my guess is they want to show um, the difference between ReLU and sigmoid. Um, ReLU may have bigger gradients, so it will not suffer from vanishing gradient. So that's my guess. Yeah. And for exploding gradient, so besides vanishing gradient, you also have exploding gradient. So what was mentioned just now, you can use clipping to um, address this problem. So this is one kind of clipping where you, you just clip the norm. So imagine your gradient is a vector and it's getting very, very big. So you clip it such that the direction is still the same, but the, the magnitude will become lesser. So by setting G, G is the DE, D theta, so which is our gradient here. So G and they'll, they'll take G hat with uh, uh, norm of G, so this means it's a unit vector here, and then it comes with, it comes with the threshold. So threshold is the um, magnitude threshold. So this is called the norm clipping. There's another kind of clipping that's not mentioned in the in the lecture, but I I found out while reading that the literature is called absolute value clipping. So um, for your gradient, it's a vector, so they'll set an absolute value. So all the elements in the vector, it is above the value, then you just clip it to that value. So it's called absolute value clipping. Um, uh, so um, in, the, in this paper, they were doing, uh, they were showing why exploding gradient will lead to, um, sorry, uh, exploding. So this is a graph of, um, they were doing experiment on a one hidden unit RNN. So this is the, um, the formula. So xd with um, sigma of xd minus one. So the only parameters here are w and b. So w here is a number and b is also a number. And they were charting on a chart of like, as they train, what is their error and what's the value of w and b. So this is their error function. And they show that um, um, when uh, for cases where exploding gradient can happen, there'll be a, what's the word called? Yeah, high curvature wall. So this is this wall will will make uh, this it means it will lead your your function it will lead your function to have like um, exploding gradient. And then let's say if your point is here and you're trying to calculate the gradient is this means it's exploding, right? it's, it's an um, infinite gradient. So it'll, it'll go all the way here, instead of going here, which is our global minimum. So that's why they, sh they show that um, for a function like this, exploding gradient is very dangerous, and it will not lead you to the global minimum, and it will just keep training. Uh, so that's why we need to clip gradient. Uh, yeah. So the dashed line will be what happens if you clip the gradient. So you will not let the step to be too big, but you just let it move until here, and then the normal gradient descent will lead you to this um, global minimum. And yeah, so this is the HPD update. So if your step size is too big, your W will become um, very different. And this is a summary of um, Vanishing gradient versus exploding gradient, um, the solution, and we'll talk more on the architecture solution for vanishing gradient later. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so Are they completely mitigated by the use uh, of radius? Or do those problems go through this at all? <coughs> no answer? 
no, no descarte. Comment, which is like, um, at least the, the, the book that we discussed before, wrap it down with that. So, I don't know if that's, it's really, really is unbounded. So, so all the books that was said in the internet, so, with the bounded sound. So, I don't know if this, you know, was that guarantee that's you know, like, relevant in a very problem. I don't know. Yeah. So I think uh, all the problems of exploding and um, vanishing gradients there, they're heavily mitigated or non-existent after you use the radius, right? Because basically you get the full, uh, the full gradient um, being passed through every time, right? So um, it gets cascaded through all the layers, you know, it doesn't um, decay or exponentially grow in that point. So that presents other types of problems too. All your little layers are training at the same time. So it's all the same So uh, if you look at those big neural networks, deep architectures of hundreds of layers, there's no way you could do that with a sigmoid, right? Forget it. And if sigmoid, all of that would have been washed out uh, with, with the thick layer of so The only way you can get through all those layers is if you're passing the full gradient culture. When you, you talk about all those uh, capsule architectures, or, or uh, I don't know, what is it? Um, something like this. All, all these other uh, networks that you hear, um, you, you have to use a really function. Okay. Yes. Pretty much all of your intermediate layers you should be using radio. Yeah. Um, it's just when you're using, um, that, that's just generally, I think, um, the current guess of how to develop neural architecture. It's just that when you have your output function, then you should be using one that corresponds to the type of problems that you're doing. Right? So process to process or something like that. There may be differences. I'm not really that well informed. Again, my students are probably more up to speed than I am. Well, no. I take that back. Definitely more up to speed than I am. Um, they will, uh, I think it depends on the type of final data you have. So a fully connected data is going to be a different But uh, you're welcome to discuss how to find things on the web and I'll put them up on Slack, debate about it, but that's what it's going to be. Let's first our thank, thank our first two uh, presenters. Okay, so just now we were talking about the vegetation gradient problem, and we have a solution which is using ReLU and better initialization, but uh, there are also better solutions here, which is uh, to use better recurrent units. So I will call those uh, the the recurrent units we have seen so far. I will call it traditional recurrent units. And now we will look at a new kind of recurrent unit called gated recurrent units or GRU. So for traditional recurrent units, the problem is we cannot learn uh, long distance dependencies because when when we are doing back propagation we have this validation gradient problem. So we will forget about the time, uh, very far away time steps. So uh, let's first look at how uh, GRU differ from the traditional uh, recurrent units. So we need to compute two gates first. The first one is called update gate, and the second one is called reset gate. So let's see how we calculate the update gate and reset gate. Actually, it's very similar to the way we calculate the hidden uh, state for traditional recurrent units. And uh, two things to take note of is, first, we have actually two sets of different uh, parameters to calculate the two gates. You can see the superscript 
uh, Z and R. So to, uh, they indicate that actually uh, the W and the two W matrices and the two U matrices are not shared between the reset gate and update gate. So they are trained uh, separately. And another thing is you can see that uh, here we are actually using a uh, sigmoid activation. This is kind of the uh, convention and we are not using like a uh, relu and I think uh, the actually there are people trying out different activations for these two gates and later I will show a uh, research work about uh, trying out these kind of different modifications but uh, empirically the results shows that uh, uh, the sigmoid activation uh, work better for the two gates yeah. and so after co calculating the two gates we can calculate the new memory content which is uh, you can see actually the new memory content is not the final uh, recurrent state we have it's just a candidate state so we calculate uh, using the formula there and you can see the there is we using we are using our reset gate to do a element wise modification with uh, u dot h t minus one and then when we have our candidate uh, unit we can calculate our final memory for this time step t so the way we calculate is we do two uh, element-wise multiplication and we calculate our HD using the last formula there. So the last formula there is really the most important thing for GRU because you can see if we set the ZT to 1, then the formula essentially becomes HD equals to HD minus 1. So this is, trying, uh, this is actually equivalent to copying over the previous mem memory state to the current memory state. And this is uh, very similar to just now the solution about using Redo because we are also, we are co when we are copying over the previous uh, memory state when we do it, when we calculate its gradient it's just it's just one so we get the full uh, gradient back to the pre previous step so uh, uh, to get some intuition this is uh, illustration and pointer okay so you can see that we are using uh, ht minus 1 to calculate ht minus 1 and the previous hidden memory ht minus 1 to uh, and the current uh, input xt to calculate the two gates after we get the two gates then we calculate the actually uh, the sequence uh, between uh, which gate to calculate doesn't matter uh, and we just need to first get the two gates first then we can calculate our candidate uh, memory state then we update our final memory state Okay, so uh, how does uh, GRU uh, fix the vanishing gradient problem? Just now we actually uh, just now I remember. Okay, uh, there's one slide uh, saying uh, a new kind of uh, network architecture called a uh, residual network. So the idea of residual network is so at the this layer L of your network, you just add the the, uh, the activation of layer L minus two directly to your current uh, uh, activation so you are just uh, adding it over and and this our idea our GRU is kind of similar similar to the idea of residual network so we want to create this kind of shortcut connections between uh, the activations so imagine if I can if I can uh, create a shortcut connection from this uh, memory state to this memory state what we need to do is just First, we copying over this memory state to the next time step, and once again, we copying over this memory step memory state to the next time step. So, how do we uh, do that with our GRU? The, like I mentioned just now, the key is really our update gate. So, if we set our update gate update gate close to one, then we are essentially copying over this uh, previous uh, memory state. So, suppose here the update gate is close to one, we are copying over the previous memory state. And once again, if this update gate is close to one, we are copying this memory state again to the next time step. So in this way, we create this kind of shortcut connections between the two uh, time steps. So uh, we can uh, we can use uh, an example to show why this kind of shortcut 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 connections is very useful. Suppose we are doing a sentiment analysis for movie reviews, and the current data is, I love this film, and then you go talk about the plot of this film. So the, to get the sentiment of this uh, review, the most important part is the front. Uh, I love this film. So suppose uh, 
this uh, actually is the word love and this is the most important thing to do your prediction and you want to remember this state uh, until the last time step then you output your final uh, sentiment prediction so, you, so we can just set all the update gate z close to 1 and so we can copy over the memory state all, all, the, all, all, all along to the last time step so until the ht plus n the final time step you still can remember the ht which is the word love then you make your sentiment prediction so this is why it's very useful so uh, here is the question we, I just talked about why the update, update gate is very important for GRU. Then why do we still need the reset gate? Uh, does anyone have any idea? Why we still need the reset gate? Okay, actually, uh, actually uh, initially I didn't think of a solution as well. So I went on to watch the lecture by Christopher Manning and his, uh, his explanation is like this. Uh, sometimes we want to forget about the unnecessary uh, unnecessary memories we keep. So let's see. Uh, we still use the sentiment analysis uh, example. Suppose the data you have is you first talk about the movie plot, then the last part is I love this film. So for suppose for all the previous time steps is describing the plot of this film, which is really unnecessary to predict the final sentiment. So you actually want to forget about all this. But if you don't have your reset gate, even if you set your even if you set your update gate, update gate to one, then your your final memory is still uh, the candidate memory, which still has a part of which still have a part of your previous memory state. So in other words, you if you do not have the reset gate, you cannot totally forget about the previous memories. So that's why we need this reset gate. So if we set this reset gate to zero and we set our update up, up gate to zero, we are essentially forgetting about the past. We only want to know about the current uh, input data. Uh, but later I will show another research work uh, which shows something uh, contradictory to this uh, explanation. So uh, I think there's really no rigorous proof to show that this kind of architecture of uh, this way we calculate and use the case as the best way to uh, solve the vanishing gradient problems or are the best way to uh, for our RN uh, architectures but they are just uh, the GRU really have stable and very rather good performance for most NLP tasks so that's a good point a toy data set of any magnitude to show that this problem is solved by this particular architecture. So even if you're doing your project to do an application level, I also encourage you, you know, perhaps as part of another course in the future, uh, to, to think about investigating this, not necessarily from a mathematical proof standpoint, but from an empirical toy data set point, where you can say, that would be immensely helpful because, you know, all through the world, people are asking the same types of questions. No one has a good solution to it. And, you know, we, we are more concerned with pushing the state of the art than understanding what we're manufacturing. And, you know, there are a lot of naysayers about AI and ML, and they're partially right. You know, we are doing things about really thinking about what happens to them. Okay, so get back to vanishing gradient problem. For those who like to see mass formulas, we can uh, show how here you solve vanishing gradient using uh, this slide. So just now we are talking, we also showed uh, this formula here when we are trying to update, let's say the W matrix, we need to calculate the gradient, and so we need we need to calculate like let's say partial H J over partial H uh, H K here, and the K the H T here is a final memory state, and the H K is every single memory state before the final uh, memory state. So sometimes uh, k is uh, very long distance before t, then you need to t 
times a lot of the partial HJ over partial HJ minus one. So if this thing is very small, then essentially you are getting uh, close to zero. And so if the our update gate is close to one, then the formula essentially becomes HT equals to HT minus one. In that case, the gradient you get is essentially one. So you are just multiplying one. So if, in other words, you are actually just get your error times one times one times one. So your error just flows back to the previous time steps without much decreasing. So that's how we solve the vanishing gradient problem. So, so far, does anyone have any questions? Okay, so we continue. This is a performance comparison. So the first part is, the first task is music generation and the second task is uh, signal, signal prediction. Yeah, and so you can see for most tasks, the GRU actually has the best performance and sometimes it even beats LSTM, and which will be elaborated later. And I also did a small experiment by myself over the, over the weekend. So it's a sentiment analysis task. You can find the data set here. So I'm using uh, the exact same setting for both the traditional iron unit and the GRUs. And the results I get is on this slide. So you can see there is really uh, quite some improvement for uh, GRU. And I also put bidirectional GRU just for a reference. In this case, you can see a uh, bidirectional GRU doesn't get a lot of improvement. I guess this be this is because for this particular data set, the uh, information from the future time steps is not that important for current time steps. So you don't see a uh, much increase here. But anyway, uh, it shows GRU are uh, really uh, at least at this task is better than our vanilla RNS. I put my source code here so you can reproduce the experiment. And I, also you can see the training time is longer than vanilla islands because you have more computations involved. And so this is a experiment done by Google. They actually did a Zara uh, architecture search over 10,000 different RN architectures. And they found that there are three uh, variants of GRUs on the right side. You can see uh, so they show that for some tasks, these three variants have better performance than GRU, but none of them can constantly uh, outperform GRU. So just like what Prof Ming said just now, uh, there's really a lot of ways you can modify the GRU and sometimes it will get better performance. Yeah, but anyway, GRU, uh, in most NRP tasks, GRU really provide a very strong baseline for your task. And Another research work, is, this is called minimal gated unit. And you can see the MGU is slightly different from GRU because it only has one gate. So the gate it, the gate it keeps is the most important gate. Uh, in, in their research, they call it the forget gate, but actually it's the same as the update gate in our GRU. And they do not have our reset gate. Instead, they are using the same forget gate for, our, for the, like, the counterpart of uh, reset gate. And one thing to take note of is this is kind of contrary to what I what I said about reset gate. Because the reason we said just now for keeping reset gate is we want to totally forget about the past. But in this situation you can see that the part forgotten in this the, the memory the previous memory state forgotten in this part is added back in you know, in the later part. In other words in MGU there's no way you can totally forget about the past. So this is different from GRU. But the result shows that uh, MGU has comparable results for uh, compared to GRUs and in some tasks they have a slight advantage. So really um, you need to you can experiment and find some modifications that works better than GRU. Yeah. And for those who like to know about backprop for GRU you can refer to this post. And it is very similar to propagation through time uh, we talked about last time. So that's all I have. Thank you. Hi all. So uh, another fancy, uh, not fancy, it's a fancy uh, RNN is long short term memory. I'm a new guy in, in deep learning, so if I make a mistake, please 
the curve and stop and, uh, uh, so we can update for the for the others. Okay, so uh, <coughs> LSTM started before GRU. So the problem of uh, RNN was we had a vanishing gradient descent and uh, we needed to somehow get rid of it. So in 1998, it was proposed uh, by uh, Schmidt Herber and the uh, Hawk writer uh, as a paper, long short term memory. From that time, this paper is just got so many citations and uh, uh, well known. Uh, also, the GRU that explain, explained before is exactly the same as LSTM with little change in the structure. Uh, also, we've seen the LSTMs perform really good in NLP and the speech and the video recognition. Uh, uh, difference from GRU is LSTM has three gates, input, output, and forget gates. Now, uh, we'll, we'll start from very simple. If we look at the RNN and the LSTM as a unit, each of them. So it's a big picture of RNN versus LSTM. It's exactly the same, except there is only one difference uh, for, if you look from the big picture. There's a red line. So we have a two connection between uh, two LSTMs. So uh, now let's go inside what's going on. So the upper side RNN, I mean, it's simplifi a simplified version. And the lower side is uh, LSTM. LSTM uh, has one more thing, or like cell memory, <coughs> ST minus one, and it outputs ST, so for the current time. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated on the downside. I also don't understand for 100%, but I'll try to uh, explain what I understood. Uh, okay, so first thing is a, a forget gate. So this is a, a mentioned highlighted with red line. Forget gates, it actually takes the value of the current uh, value and the previous hidden states and it decides, since it's sigmoid, it's between zero and one, it would decide how much I want to forget uh, uh, given the uh, current data. So we can think, uh, I, I think it in this following way. Uh, imagine the uh, two people are having a conversation about cars. One has, uh, both of them have different colors, uh, cars, and uh, if the conversation switched between them. Uh, sometimes we should forget about uh, ex uh, explicit uh, color of specific car because it's two different colors. So that's why we need a uh, forget gate. Uh, okay, so uh, again, there's also input gate. So we have an input gate, which, uh, which, which is also intuitive. We want to get the information from the current data and it decides how much information we get from the current data. Also, it's a sigmoid, it means uh, between zero and one. So we also calculate the uh, internal cell stage with which we will be using further. Uh, so that's uh, probably the, the big difference of uh, LSTM from any other RNN uh, because now we have a cell state which would uh, incorporate the forget gate and input gate. So uh, for me, understanding this one was hard, but then we start with GRU, because GRU is more simple. Remember we had an update gate, DT, and DT minus one for state. Uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, it reminds me like a Kalman filter. When we have a Kalman filter, when we use it for different, uh, let's say, signals, we want to, one comes from the sensor, uh, one comes from the, our dynamics, we say, Dynamics calculation is bad because there's a physics we cannot move correctly. Some always something wrong. And sensor, there's no perfect sensor, but we want to put it together. And when we put together, we want to trust the sensor as, as some with I don't know, 80% uh, and 20% we trust for uh, for uh, you know, dynamics. So that's why we obtain the Kalman update. It's exactly the same as in uh, GRU works exactly in the same way. So if I trust uh, for the hidden states this much, then one minus that one, I trust uh, for the current state. So, but here, a little different because now the trust comes from, so I have a forward case, so forward case is comp uh, computed by the current data. So FT and the IT is not related as in the GRU. So the, the, uh, this thing was the uh, is uh, FP and the IT are both when you if you sum it's completely different and uh, independent of each other. Maybe it's true, 
we, we don't know. It's also the same for if you came from uh, the background of uh, signals, you also know that Kalman filter, what, the choose of uh, weight, we also don't know it. why we choose alpha and one lines alpha for two different things. It's also the sa uh, same, but LSTM performs in some tasks very good. But that's an idea behind it. Uh, okay, so we also have an output gate uh, and then like a hidden state updated in this way. I think it's the same as everywhere. Uh, okay. Uh, some visualizations. I was uh, all this uh, visualization done by motivation from uh, Chris Ola's uh, blog. So if you go there, you can uh, see how he explains this. Very good. Uh, and also, there are more overwhelming illustrations, um, such as like this. If, uh, I found it very difficult to understand. But one thing that I really like is this uh, visualization, which is inspired by code. So here you can see, if you want to program, you can see the, all the matrices and the biases and the, how they are related to each other and how, where it goes. So if, to write a program, I think this one is uh, very good. So for <clears throat> so as I said, the update for forget and ignore would be accomplished by three this uh, layers as shown here, uh, and the rest I think is exactly the same as for uh, usual vanilla RNN. Okay, so LSTM uh, uh, is sensitive for special uh, for the position, so it means that the data has a special uh, correlation, so LSTM can perform good. You guys realize what is uh, this text from which book it's taken? Uh, this one, I, I, I first read twice and then I realized that it's a war and the peace by uh, Leo Tolstoy. So I read it in Russian three times and I understood uh, like 30%. It's really complicated. Uh, and I understood on the surface. You understand 20% when you read first time and the rest, it's very difficult to understand. But I think LSTM does a really good job on this. They're much better than me. Yeah. Okay, that also uh, LSTM can uh, point to the codes and the, in the machine translation it can also work with the uh, uh, if statements. But if you want to understand uh, each, va each value of the LSTM, uh, you cannot interpret it. So that's how I understand. Uh, Okay, so LSTMs are very powerful uh, when we use for deep, deep neural networks since we don't have vanishing problem. Uh, if you have a deep inter uh, neural network, then it means that you need to have a lot of data. Uh, okay, uh, so far uh, LSTMs are doing really good job uh, in various tasks, this uh, NLP task. So uh, we see that uh, LSTM with uh, Beam size one, but ensemble of five L reverse LSTMs perform much better than single reverse LSTM with beam size of 12. Uh, but we know that beam size, uh, beam size 12 is much more harder for calculations along. It's long uh, beam size. Okay, so you can also find the results for the machine translation conference in 2016 for various uh, proposed uh, architecture using LSTM. Uh, okay, this one is, uh, I saw th this in this following way. So when we output the hidden layer at the last step, if we have these values and we span it in some dimension, given the number of words in our dictionary using a PCA, then LSTM actually can make some uh, 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 connections between them. If you look at the, uh, the this one and this axis, if you have a beam size small, so you can understand that SPM can make a connection uh, between those statements in a smaller variance, while for, for more beam size, you, you get higher variance. I think it makes sense. Uh, okay, I came from the robotics background, it's not NLP. So uh, how the LSTM also used in a robotics, so we have a robot, and a, like imagine that all the robots are now have a vision. But there's sometimes that vision cannot work because light is not there. If we want to send a robot to, to some, uh, I don't know, uh, space or something. So uh, there's some case where we cannot benefit from vision. But as a human, we can touch. And once we touch, we start to feel. 
So before uh, touch and the sliding of the uh, objects, we were handling using it. We generate the features and we train it using SVM, all this stuff. Now uh, we have a LSTM, now we get that sensor data. We use the tactile sensor, which is the skin of the robot, the same as human skin, but much uh, less uh, complicated. Uh, so we, since uh, LSTM can handle special uh, temporal signal, so it can handle special and also temporal, we can use LSTM because if you want to understand about object, we slide it. Sliding means it depends on the time. And then we get the results. Ah, that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions. Uh, we don't have the gate here, but I got your question. So how uh, LSTM knows when to remove or when to not remove, right? So since it looks for the current data, uh, we are we we have an idea about the special data. It means that we can now correlate the uh, make a connection between two different uh, data. It means one data is defined with some like it has a color. Let's say car has a color. So now once the conversation has changed it another person has a different color, a car with different color. Then new data comes comes every time with different color. It makes the, uh, the neural network uh, to forget about the previous color because now it doesn't make any sense. It's a new color. That's what I understand. Maybe anyone else can explain better. Okay, thank you. So you've heard right now a few comparable architectures that I'd like to think about, and I put a pull on the back of the one. Think about uh, the differences between the CRD and the other. The very comparable architecture, uh, so you know. Not sure that that's fine. Most people who use them don't know anything. So uh, it's just the electron is good. Uh, okay, so uh, for this fancy RN, uh, including the GRU and uh, uh, LSTM, uh, there is a problem. The problem is that uh, we just uh, learned from the previous uh, information set of the, the, the future. Uh, time steps information. So from uh, this two sentence here. So if, let's say uh, we give you the key set, uh, you don't know what the tidy pair means. Uh, that means the tidy pair or the friend then. So uh, that's the problem here why we need the uh, bi directional RNN we call the RNN. Uh, so the, the solution uh, is we have uh, two types of solution. Uh, the first one is the forward. It, uh, so from this uh, chart, it's simple. So uh, compared with the previous uh, GRU and the uh, uh, normal RNN, we have two directions. One is the forward. Another one uh, is the backward. So forward, uh, we learn the uh, information from the um, previous uh, time step. And the backward, we will learn from the future. So that's the, the structure. Uh, if we go to more details, uh, so here you see we have uh, two directions, and uh, so each load, we, we actually have two loads here. Uh, so compared with the uh, normal RNN, uh, so we, for each uh, edge, we have the two different directions at the right side. 
uh, actually this is the most uh, 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 difference. And for the Y, you see we uh, we have we will combine the the two edge, uh, the forward and the backward. The width will be reduced. Reduced means that so the for the seam duration will reduce, but for the forward and the backward, uh, uh, the different duration, uh, the the width are independent. Uh, so we can use uh, the conventional RM, uh, LSTM and GRU uh, in this model. Okay, now how to train this uh, 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 BRN? Uh, I tried to search uh, to see if I can find the details uh, formula, uh, but uh, unfortunately I didn't find. So this is a basic step. Uh, so for the, because we have two directions, actually, so for the forward direction from T, uh, from one to the end, we will adjust the forward pass the for the hidden layer and we store the activation at each time step. Uh, and for the back direction, uh, actually the same way, but uh, just a different direction from uh, the back to the, the front. And for all the T's, uh, any order, we finally we will uh, forward pass for the output layer and using the stored activation from both hidden layers. So for the backward pass, uh, actually it's similar with the uh, normal RN, but also we still uh, consider the two different ways. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this paper is uh, uh, the first paper uh, they mentioned the uh, uh, BRN uh, in the paper. Uh, they mentioned when modified the uh, BRN. So here, the main difference is that. <coughs> so this this part. Uh, so you see the difference here is the input. input. Uh, so the output they will use both the input and the. Uh, uh, this is the forward uh, output. This is the back. Uh, this is uh, the T times. Uh, output, so it's a little. Uh, there's a little different with uh, uh, the one introduced uh, in last slide, uh, but uh, I I didn't uh, explore more details about uh, in which case we will use this one. Uh, the paper mentioned that in some case, if you will calculate uh, some conditional probability, uh, we may use this model. But if you want to know details, uh, please uh, read this paper. <coughs> Okay, the last one is uh, deep, we call multi-layer uh, uh, BRN. Uh, the difference is that you see here we have uh, multiple layers. Uh, so for one node, actually it will use uh, three different uh, parameter outputs. The one is from the previous uh, uh, hidden layer and the also larger to here the previous laser post the duration is also here. So this is the uh, uh, deep BRN. Uh, then that's all for the BRN and the uh, RN and the deep RN. Any questions? For what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, because why we like this one, uh, maybe we can choose one. Example, okay. uh, anyway, yes. Uh, because the uh, only difference is that, let's see if we we have the Z set tidy. Uh, so, I think you GRU and the LTSM, they just, uh, okay, for, the, the forward direction, right? So now, we because we want to uh, generate or predict what's the next word, then with this this set tidy, then the backward uh, direction we can also uh, predict the width, and finally we use it to predict the next word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I can try to explain. Uh, anyone can, if I'm wrong, anyone can correct me. So I, I think, uh, maybe you take this, the first one. Okay, so let's see if we, we only know he said crazy, then based on these three words, we can uh, actually uh, calculate and get the week, right? Uh, with the, the way we introduced that. So that means we only know this uh, three words, but we already have this the week. And with this week, we can predict uh, whether it's uh, bears or any other words. That means we don't need to actually know the, the future work there. Yeah. Because if you think from the normal GRU or LSDM, that's the same way. But the BRN, my understanding, that means we need to know the future word which we want to uh, generate. Because our target is to using this existing word to learn and to predict the future word. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah, we we just uh, learn from the country existing word, right? What we have. Yeah. What what word we have? We learn from this. So my understanding is, uh, let's see if we have uh, ABC working. Okay. And this is the input. So we, with the RIN, we will predict the, what the next word, right? So now with the BRN, still we have this ABC here. We, we will, so just by different duration, because right now with ABC, we can predict this, uh, maybe this is D. Okay, so now this, the uh, different duration from C, D, A, we can also get some weight here. With the same way, we can also predict what's the next work. Uh, yes, that means we need to know the future work after the See again? Yeah, my understanding is the inputs are same, but just to be, we consider from deep, uh, we consider both directions. Yeah, and, and here the width here, uh, different duration, the width are different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I think it's for our whole field, for the RIA. Thank you. So I don't have any particular updates for you. Uh, I think while you guys were all presenting and talking, I've made comments on all the project proposals that came in. But there are a lot more of you here than there are people doing projects in the project proposal bin. 
So I wonder what the rest of you are doing. So I am hoping that uh, all of you who are not first year PhD students compelled, uh, not, sorry, who optionally have a choice not to do a project, uh, will put in their proposals by the end of tonight. Uh, if you are here in this room or online enjoying the class or participating in it, it would be much more meaningful and part of the obligations of the class to participate. Okay, if this class is only possible when people actually get involved in it. Um, the questioner and the presenter duties are sort of the more straightforward ones, but the, the project is an integral part, uh, like Jeremy Howard says on FSAI. You'll only learn the stuff if you practice it. Doing the math does not help you practice anything, okay? It helps you get some theoretical understanding, but you have to practice it to get your hands dirty. So please go get your hands dirty, or at least consume a lot of electricity so we can make Elon Musk rich, okay? Or SP Power or whatever, Jerome, uh, uh, whatever. Okay, uh, the second thing is that uh, we will have, I guess, uh, an outing on uh, week seven. So next week we have recess break, but of course that means you guys will be here because we have our uh, week recess team uh, ready and waiting. Um, so week seven after that, two weeks from now, after class, we will head over to the NUS staff club near uh, the AYE on the side over there for those of you who are here and join us for a uh, social event if you want to clear your schedule for that. Uh, any questions? No? Okay, thank you very much everyone uh, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>